A very disturbing report came out this week, which has reignited questions about the effectiveness of UN peacekeeping forces. According to this report, Rwandan rebels occupied the Congolese town of Luvungi for four days, looting local homes and gang raping more than 150 women and children. All this despite the fact that less than 20 miles away, two dozen soldiers from the UN peacekeeping force were completely unaware and even made mobile patrols through the villages surrounding the town itself, but failed to notice the rebels had simply run into the woods to hide. So how could this have happened? And will this be that final nail in the coffin for the UN's credibility as an international peacekeeping force? Well, joining me to discuss it from our New York studio is Dex Torrid Barton, an international security analyst for the UN. Uh, Dex, thanks so much for joining me. You know, has there been any kind of an official explanation from these UN peacekeeping forces that were there as to how this was going on for four days, just 20 miles away, and they had absolutely no idea? Well, the uh, territory around Luvungi and the six other villages that were attacked is extremely inhospitable. It may uh, sound like UN peacekeepers were right next door, but this is 20 miles of some of the most rural uh, infrastructure and some of the most uh, destroyed territory imaginable in the DR Congo. This is an area that's been racked by violence, you know, not just through the civil war, but uh, throughout the aftermath. And the idea that UN peacekeepers knew about the attack but then failed to act is absurd. What we are seeing is the result of the shattered civilian and social infrastructure in the DR Congo. Well, I don't think that the idea here is that the UN peacekeepers knew about the attack and ignored it. Quite the opposite. It's what is the effectiveness of the UN peacekeepers if they're there? You know, I mean, let's get a few numbers out there. This was at one point the UN's most expensive peacekeeping mission. 20,000 peacekeepers in the country. $1.4 billion was the budget for the last year here. And yet, you know, murder and plunder clearly continue here. So, I mean, do you think that that proves that the UN peacekeeping forces here are not effective? Well, let's talk about numbers for a moment. The, the budget for this year's uh, operations in Congo is actually $823 billion, And of that, less than $400 billion has actually been received by the United Nations. Countries have yet to actually put their money where their mouths are. In DR Congo, we've seen troops in the same province going into action throughout the period where they were allegedly neglecting their duties. On August 1st, they were freeing hostages in North Kivu province. On August 2nd and 3rd, they were working with Congolese army forces in an exchange of fire with the same Rwandan rebels who attacked these villages. I think peacekeepers have demonstrated their value, and they've also demonstrated that they are able to project security when the infrastructure, in terms of development, accompanies the gains made in security. Obviously, there's going to have to be changes made after this. It is not acceptable that violence on such a scale takes place at this level, especially coming up to the end of peacekeeping mandate in Congo probably next year. But we should not say that the UN is the villain here. The real villains are the rebels who attacked these villagers. Well, I think the question here is not whether the UN is a villain or not. Again, it's whether the UN is effective, whether somebody else could do a better job. And as you said, obviously now there are going to have to be some changes after uh, you know, this grave tragedy occurred. But what kind of changes? You know, what are they planning to do, uh, not only in terms of action, but also in cleaning up this horrible PR story? Well, first of all, uh, the real action will not take place at the PR level. Uh, whatever PR consequences there are for the UN, the organization will shoulder that. The question is how to strengthen forces, as you said. What we need is, first of all, greater numbers of troops on the ground, 24 troops in an area patrolling 300 square miles. Not acceptable. More than that, the villages which were attacked, out of the seven villages, there was one working telephone line in those villages before the attacks. And that probably played a critical role in preventing villagers actually contacting the authorities when the attack began. Subsequently, after the attack, villagers had several days before they could actually get to the main roads, which weren't occupied by rebels, in order to contact the UN forces. So those kind of changes, strengthening the communications infrastructure immediately following this attack, will go a long way towards preventing further attacks. Uh, okay, my last question here is, uh, as you're right, infrastructure, strengthening that and communication is one part of it, but it's also knowing 
who your friends and who your enemies uh, and who your enemies are. You know, there's been a lot of questions uh, questions lately about allegiance and about intentions. You know, certain people that have been absorbed into the army that may have been warlords. Now there have been army commanders accused of supplying the very forces that they're supposed to be fighting against with weapons. And Human Rights Watch even says that the UN might now be risking becoming complicit in atrocities against civilians. So how do you fix that? What's to be done? When we choose partners to work on the ground in these conflict areas, we need to choose them carefully. That's a lesson that has emerged out of every single conflict which the UN has been involved with since the Second World War. In Congo, we have unreliable partners often. We have people who you can't always determine their exact allegiances or their motivations. That's a fact of life. It will go on. We have to ensure that the monitoring mechanisms in place are strong and that the outside world, including organizations like Human Rights Watch, are listened to inside the United Nations. And I think in terms of the progress we've made in integrating partners into the UN structure, uh, the results speak for themselves. And frankly, it should be noted that... In I'm sorry, we're running out of time. I have to wrap it up. But this is definitely a region that needs more international uh, attention. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely.